Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining um, our event today. And today, um, the title of the event is called Giving a Brain and a Voice to Meta Humans in the Metaverse. Um, uh, our speaker is the CEO of uh, Sapien X, Davy Cullen. So yeah, so I will pass the baton to David. David, you can uh, start uh, sharing your presentation. Thank you. That sounds great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Colleen, uh, CEO of SapienX. Thank you for taking time out of your Saturday morning to come uh, join this discussion. And hopefully it is a discussion. I'm going to do a little show and tell for you, but uh, hopefully then open it up and uh, field questions and find out a little bit more about what you're doing and how it maps into the, the things that we've been up to. Uh, before I uh, get going here, I'd like to give Just a little... wait for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the microphone, I accidentally left. Sorry. Uh, so I'd like to give you a little background on, uh, on what we've been up to um, and how we, how we got to this point. Uh, all right, Jim, you're muted now. <laughs> uh, my background, by the way, uh, out of college was, uh, was architecture. And uh, I was kind of a radical young architect coming out of Cornell and heading west to San Francisco to design high rise buildings. But uh, while I was still in school, I was infected by uh, uh, my structural engineering professor, Don Greenberg, who was, uh, uh, turns out, one of the founding fathers of computer graphics. And I got the notion that you could design uh, uh, buildings and cities using a computer, which is very common now, but was unheard of back then. So that's how I got into this. And uh, before long, I had started a an architecture firm and uh, then a uh, computer animation firm to uh, do simulations of cities. Uh, in 1995, I was backpacking with a friend who said, how would you like to put the first virtual city online? And that sounded really cool. Uh, she was working on a plugin for Netscape and we literally put the, the first 3D things uh, online in uh, fall of 1995. Uh, these were everything from virtual places to digital characters. So uh, that's how we entered all this and uh, started creating uh, the, the first uh, building blocks of the metaverse. Fast forwarding to today, um, I suppose I got a little tired of 3D things. So six years ago, uh, we founded uh, Sapien X uh, with uh, my old friends, uh, Macklin Marvitt and uh, Bruce Wilcox, uh, two great engineers, uh, one uh, coming from an AI background and the other was uh, coming from a large team engineering background. And uh, we formed Sapien X on the premise that you should just be able to talk conversationally to, uh, uh, to products and computers. And uh, that was kind of a novel thing and it's worked out for us. So I'm gonna show you a video of uh, our latest conversational character and uh, then go into a, a discussion about what inspires us, uh, what we're doing, uh, what's needed to make wonderful characters that delight people and can uh, be anything from a uh, uh, customer service representative to a, uh, uh, a character that tells you about things, whether it's a product or how to find your train or your next airplane ride or, or whatever. Uh, let's start out with a screen share here. Okay, so here's a video from Pete Preston. Hi, I'm David Colleen, CEO of SapienX, and we're here at CES 2022 in Las Vegas. It's a great time for us. We were here a couple of years ago showing our conversational characters as interfaces for robots and cars and all sorts of consumer electronics. We have something brand new this time to show, and that's Sage right behind me. Uh, Sage is our first high-resolution character that can walk and talk and be shown at full size on large screens. And if you look closely, you can even see things like the little hairs on her, uh, on her eyebrows. There's so much detail and resolution to these characters that they can effectively act in a retail setting to help sell something or perhaps at a, uh, an airport to guide people to their next airplane. 
we're just beginning to engage with customers in using Sage, and people already have wonderful ideas of how best, but enough talk. L let me show you how Sage works. Good morning. Good morning. What are you? I'm an AI that can answer questions for you. What can you show me? I can show you how accurately I can answer your questions about myself or Sapientx. How do I use you? Just by telling me what you want. Are you available now? Absolutely. Just talk with us to get started. Why should I use an avatar? Because they increase trust and satisfaction with my users. And because it's more fun when you can see who you're speaking to. I like you. Thank you. I like you too. I'm glad I got your attention. I'm here to show you how I can be your product spokesperson and brand ambassador. So that, that's a marketing video, but uh, we want to introduce uh, the, the world to the sorts of things that we're doing. Uh, this work began for us, by the way, four years ago, we uh, uh, brought Alex Hessler onto our team. He had just left uh, Pixar uh, and brought uh, Jack Kim with him from uh, Tippett Studios. Uh, together, they had worked on movies like Harry Potter and the, the original Avatar movie. And uh, Jack is one of the finest character animators uh, on the planet and uh, was busy working with us in the early days to create these conversational characters. Now, I'm, I'm proud of where we are at the moment, but you can also see there's a, there's a lot, to, uh, lot to do yet to making really, really wonderful characters that uh, are completely conversational and uh, act like human beings and can interact with people in, in manners that we're used to uh, having uh, interactions with. So I'd like to step through some of the things that, uh, that have inspired us and uh, the, the key players that have created technologies that were useful to us and, and necessary to, to build uh, convincing characters. Uh, before I go into that, do I have any initial questions from folks? Okay, now let me uh, do a screen share on the PowerPoint. Okay. So, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, we got going on this because we thought that the older voice systems that were designed for, for phone systems, they were geared for very simple yes and no uh, questions, uh, guiding people through a, a menu system. And even the, the, the biggest, uh, most resourced technology companies today, like uh, Microsoft and Google and uh, Amazon and, and, and Apple, have uh, assistants that are still based in these old uh, days of IVRs. Uh, they've added a lot to them. They've made them more sophisticated, more complicated. Uh, but uh, products like Alexa began as simple chatbots. Uh, actually, uh, we, we test Alexa on a regular basis and we found that her accuracy in understanding what you're saying has actually degraded over time. It's like they're adding too much into these systems. Uh, we took a different path. Uh, our very first conversational agents were uh, back in 2003 uh, doing research for the government. Uh, it was way too early then, but uh, uh, we, uh, we thought that it was a very compelling idea that you could talk to your, your technology. Uh, fast forward uh, a few years and uh, Oh, let, let, let me back up a moment and talk a little bit more about what inspired us and what got us going on this track so that you have some context for this. Actually, all of these AI characters are almost 100 years old if you, if you go back into it. The first mainstream sort of uh, depiction of an, an AI-driven character uh, was uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis back in 1927. Uh, I think the first time as a kid that I was aware of the notion of an autonomous character was uh, was the Wizard of Oz, and uh, I think that still 
uh, very much on people's minds. Uh, it's still a great movie today, inspiring folks. I was, uh, I was born in 1958, I'm uh, 63 years old now. And so I went through the 60s and uh, I remember great delight on things like uh, Disney announcing uh, a talking Abe Lincoln. So if you went to Disneyland, you could see a robotic presentation and a, and a uh, uh, synthetic voice, something simulating an AI powered character. Uh, these things filled our imaginations and got us very excited. When Lost in Space came out, I was the same age as that little boy in the in the image there, and uh, the notion that you could talk to a robot and have him uh, interact with you and do things with you was was really exciting. What I didn't know as a little boy was that uh, uh, Eliza uh, came out in 1966. Uh, Joseph uh, had brought out a simple chatbot that uh, could interact with you. And uh, this was the beginning of uh, the conversational systems that we use today. In fact, most of the conversational chatbots out there have really not evolved much at all since 1966. But I'll talk more about that in a bit. And then the other thing that really was not a robot or an AI character was uh, ventriloquist dummies. They were very common on TV shows uh, back in the 60s. And uh, as a young boy, you could fantasize that these characters were real. So these were some of the seminal things that were influencing us. Uh, fast forwarding a bit, um, finally, all these things uh, started appearing in movies. Um, uh, first with, uh, with Blade Runner in 82, it's very exciting, the notion that you could have uh, uh, synthetic uh, Android characters. Uh, Lawnmower Man was the first really wonderful CG uh, thing and it looks very primitive now, but back in 1992, it was uh, it was really groundbreaking. Now this was just before we started putting our own 3D online, so this was very much on our minds as we were building uh, the metaverse. The AI movie, of course, uh, stimulated things, and the very first AI-powered 3D character uh, was uh, built by a good friend of mine, uh, Karen Marcello. Uh, for performance artist Stellar back in 2002. This literally was the first 3D talking head that was powered by something that was arguably an AI system. Uh, it very much influenced us and we brought Karen onto our team the following year to do our first work for the government. Uh, Sage was done by uh, my earlier company, Planet Nine in 2003. And uh, several years later, 2009, we were busy doing uh, a game platform that also um, could be used for uh, uh, navigation in your car and for handheld devices. And uh, that's when we brought um, my co-founder, Bruce Wilcox, onto our team. Uh, Bruce headed AI at several large game companies like 3DO, and uh, he did a ground up development of an AI system that was uh, based in symbolic reasoning and uh, that took as its premise that conversation was going to be the future of uh, voice interaction with computers. So our very first uh, uh, system that we built uh, was geared towards uh, giving a voice to navigation systems, but, but also to a game platform. You can see we're interacting with a little AI character uh, in the bottom right hand image. Uh, Sylvie uh, was a character that would give clues in the in the game that we were developing at the time called uh, Dark Design. Then a very negative thing happened to the whole industry. Polar Express came out in 2004. It was a kid's movie. And a lot of people watched it. A lot of people were creeped out uh, over it. And the, the term uncanny valley was formed at that time. The problem with Polar Express was um, that the emotions being um, generated and displayed by the characters were wildly out of sync with what, what they were saying. And as human beings, the things that we are most attuned to is detection of uh, nuances in the faces of people that we're talking to. So it was extremely apparent to anybody watching the movie that this movie was out of sync. So uh, at this point, Uncanny Valley was discussed in the press so much 
that um, a lot of people decided that the uncanny valley was something that couldn't be conquered and that we should not try to make synthetic characters uh, depicting humans because we just couldn't do it. Well, I've always seen it differently. I, I believe that it's a glass ceiling and that uh, we can get past Uncanny Valley just by being better. So I'm going to describe uh, what steps we are taking to get past Uncanny Valley. And uh, I believe we're getting real, real close to that now. Now, coming to near term, uh, there was a lot of development relevant to our digital characters in other domains. Uh, robots continued to progress. Uh, in fact, when we were at CES uh, five years ago, there were dozens of little home robots all uh, trying to find usefulness in, in the home and delighting characters. And many of them had voice systems, uh, very basic voice systems, but, uh, but they were important. There's also a whole side of the industry that's not talked about a lot. And that's uh, the sex robots. Uh, they're especially popular in uh, Japan and uh, South Korea. Uh, uh, people are continuing to develop and improve on rubber-faced robots like this. It's not my cup of tea, but uh, genuine uh, technology development is happening in, in these spaces. Uh, I think we've got a long way to go, but uh, there are companies actually selling these robots. So. Uh, we have worked with uh, three different robot companies so far. You can see about, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner an image of uh, uh, the future robots, uh, Furrow robot. Uh, we were showing that uh, five years ago at CES. So we provided the voice system and uh, avatar control for this robot. And uh, I, I don't know that anybody's really hitting out of the park yet for home robots, but uh, uh, there's still a lot of investment and progress being made in the robot space. It's relevant to what we're doing. Now, one thing I'll say in general, all of the robot work out there right now has, um, has a misunderstanding, I believe, of, uh, of uh, what a robot's face should look like. Uh, every robot maker that I talk to believes that an abstract representation of, uh, of a human face is the ideal uh, display for uh, for a robot's face. Turns out that that's not true. Um, the uh, uh, four years ago there was uh, published an IEEE paper, and there's a link at the bottom here if you want to follow it out. Uh, I'll provide the slide set by the way afterwards, so you can hit links like that. Uh, turns out that uh, in this study it was found that users greatly prefer faces that are actually more human-like and more realistic over the abstract representations. This flies in the face of everything that, uh, that had previously been known in academia and held closely by people who are producing robots or even digital entities uh, uh, that are displayed on your computer screens. So this was a watershed for us and, and it reinforced in our own minds the importance of what we were doing in trying to make uh, more detailed, more realistic appearing characters. So there's four main technologies that we, we use in uh, developing these conversational characters. The first one is just 3D models. Um, and there's been so much wonderful work that's gone into 3D modeling that I'd say we are pretty much, uh, we've pretty much solved the difficult part of making realistic looking characters. In fact, uh, uh, things like Epic's Metahumans that were released uh, uh, a year ago um, are so realistic that when I show pictures of them to people, they believe that they're they're real people until I tell them that they're syn synthetic. So I think we're pretty much there. Uh, Human-like vo voice performance. And I'm going to show you some of our demos that use uh, pretty standardized uh, uh, voice uh, generation systems, uh, the, the same that you might use for Amazon Alexa. And they're, they're still uh, obviously mechanical, but there are advanced projects right now, uh, such as uh, uh, Google's work, where they're making voices that are very accurate. So uh, 
The problem is, is they're running on super computers. Uh, over the next year or two, I believe we're going to take things that require a supercomputer and optimize them so that we can give uh, perfectly uh, human sounding voices to even mobile devices like your, like your uh, cell phone. Uh, so we're pretty close to solving that. Uh, our team is focused on conversational AI. That's the core of what we do, doing natural language understanding to uh, understand people as they speak conversationally without having to learn commands and then give the proper response or, or, or action. Uh, I'm not gonna say that we're 100% of the way there, uh, but we, we're in a really good place. Uh, I, I would estimate that we're 70% along the way of our task in making really good conversational characters. By far the weakest part of what we're doing is generating uh, synthetic animation uh, of everything from uh, body movements, hand gestures, but also uh, more detailed things like the movement of the mouth or the eyes. Uh, we have so much work to do in this area and, and it's really something that we're working very hard on, but I, I think it's gonna take a couple of years before we get to a great spot in that. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but uh, we need to get all of these items to 98% before we have really, really delightful characters uh, that, that we can use uh, uh, for the tasks that we're uh, trying to achieve at SAPNX. I'd like to talk a moment about some of the people that have worked on, uh, on this and give them some kudos for, for their work. Uh, I think one of the strongest, most important people in this space has been Jorge Jimenez in Spain uh, working on uh, realistic modeling of humans. And Jorge, uh, coming from an academic background, has been very good at sharing his work and inspiring others. So for instance, he published his first paper on subsurface scattering in 2011, and uh, uh, Shader Toy was based on that paper and uh, took those concepts and made really, really realistic looking eyeballs. And, and they shared that. So everybody's making use of that research to improve uh, the, the eyes and characters today. Uh, Jorge now is, uh, is head of technology at a game company. Uh, his, his work is in uh, the shipping Call of Duty uh, characters. And you see how wonderful they are. But they've also inspired others in the space, uh, such as Three Lateral, making dramatically realistic looking characters for games. And Three Lateral was, uh, was acquired by Epic and uh, became uh, the metahumans uh, that have been available over the past year. Our own work, you can see uh, Jack and Alex's work uh, going back four years ago. Our first really high resolution character uh, was uh, Geraint. We thought we'd start with a craggy old man because it was uh, uh, one of the most difficult tasks to get all the, the wrinkles and all the detail in the face. And we certainly did that. Unfortunately, Geraint scared most people who saw him uh, talking conversationally. Uh, next, we did uh, Kayla, uh, an android. And uh, Kayla also creeped people out. So uh, we kind of learned some, uh, some lessons the hard way in terms of what people wanted to see and uh, who they wanted to interact with. This all splashed onto the big screen two years ago at, at CES uh, when Samsung uh, made a promotional um, uh, display of, uh, of the NEON project. Uh, it was a very ambitious project, uh, the notion that you could have high resolution characters that you could converse with. Uh, as, uh, as good as it was, as compelling as it was, uh, it also had a lot of issues. It was perhaps overly ambitious. Uh, the characters were so computationally intensive that in order to talk to a character, you had to turn off all the rest of the character's animation uh, b just so that uh, the three computers that were running it could, uh, could keep up with the processing needed to process the speech. So, uh, uh, there were wonderful things about this and inspired a lot of people to begin making high resolution characters. Uh, the team at Samsung never really fulfilled their promise. Uh, they released a beta of it uh, a year ago and all the beta would do would be to create a movie of one of these characters. And there's some usefulness in that, but it's really not the promise that they were uh, 
uh, puffing two years ago at the, the show. Um, since then, uh, the core of the team has moved on and, and we may see them emerge and uh, create a, a new company this year. Uh, I, ho I hope we do. Uh, they're talented people and have a lot to, uh, to offer to, uh, to the largesse of what we're all trying to do as a community to, to make great characters. I don't know what uh, Samsung's going to do with it, whether the unit shut down or whether they're just biding their time to improve the technology. Time will tell. There's also other people that, uh, that have been busy working on characters. Um, most of these companies, uh, such as Soul Machines and Oven, uh, come from um, a computer animation background, and uh, they have made really good looking characters that don't converse very well. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, for instance, Soul Machines had worked with IBM Watson. Uh, I've never worked with IBM Watson myself, but a lot of uh, people I know have and have complained that it's really difficult to work with and that it's really not geared very much for, uh, for conversation. So that points out a problem. Um, to deliver great characters requires a lot of very specialized skills, and very few companies have all of those skills ranging from, uh, from uh, linguistics to uh, computational uh, linguistics to uh, character animation to uh, uh, computer engineering to de deliver complete conversational characters. And that's one of the things that we're very much focused on is making this easier for people. We want to have products that are fairly off the shelf that people can take, uh, add conversation to them, maintain them, extend them, and uh, make meaningful products with them. So uh, while these are all great efforts uh, from, from companies like this, uh, we, we as a community still have a long way to go. Our own work two years ago, uh, I'll show you, uh, show you Hank in a moment here. Uh, Hank is, uh, is a doctor character that we're developing. Hazel is a, a bit of a departure for us. Hazel was our first uh, uh, animal-based character. Uh, Hazel could talk. Uh, Hazel was developed for Yamaha, who was uh, working on a, a new product area for their company of servicing uh, seniors. So the notion is that Hazel is a companion for seniors. You can talk to her, you can have her perform tasks for you, but also there's a, uh, a health side to Hazel. Uh, she does cognitive assessment uh, and can inform a health team if, uh, if you are at a pivot point in uh, your cognitive abilities, either in decline or improving your cognitive abilities. So uh, we're using our AI uh, system in some interesting ways to, uh, to learn about humans, uh, not to sell their 3D data like, uh, like Amazon or, or, or Apple would do with your data, but to, uh, to do a better and better job of uh, providing care for you and uh, nurturing uh, the user. Uh, so these are important tasks and we're excited to be, be working on them. We had a large watershed moment a year ago. Last February, uh, Epic released uh, uh, the results of their three lateral acquisition, uh, calling the new characters metahumans. Uh, so you can, in the uh, Unreal game engine, add all of these wonderful characters for free into your, uh, into your game or your product interface. And this was the first time that a company had made it, made state-of-the-art characters available to a large audience that they could take and run with and start building uh, with them. As wonderful as they are, they are just uh, puppets, if you will. Uh, they're waiting for you to animate them. They're waiting for you to add a voice to them. And uh, uh, last, uh, last fall, we showed uh, the very first uh, metahumans publicly that could actually uh, talk with you. And uh, that was the Sage character that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. Uh, this was huge. And uh, you may have noticed in the press that Unity, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, direct competitor of, uh, of the Unreal game engine. Uh, Unity acquired its own uh, uh, company and is beginning to integrate 
uh, high resolution characters into, uh, into their gate pipeline. So um, uh, that's not ready for, for, uh, for use yet, uh, unless you're just making um, uh, movies with the characters. But in terms of real time use of the characters, they're not fully integrated into uh, Unity yet. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, next month uh, at the Game Developers Conference, maybe uh, Unity will share more of their work with us on and their game plan on, uh, on the release of those high resolution characters. This was a wonderful thing for us. It meant that uh, our customers could take off the shelf characters and begin to build metahumans that uh, could interact with people. So I showed you already a, a video of Sage. This literally is us taking one of the metahumans. Remember, we're not in the, the avatar business per se. We're in the natural language understanding business. We don't want to make avatars. We don't want to make avatar control systems. We want to make it easy for our customers to take our AI and to easily integrate it into off-the-shelf uh, character platforms, uh, so, such as the Epix MetaHumans. Uh, this is the company, uh, Ziva Dynamics, that uh, Unity just acquired last month. And uh, they're, they're doing similar work to, uh, to what Epic has in the MetaHumans, but it's not uh, uh, as far along. So I imagine they're gonna put a lot of resources into this and, and make them available uh, a little bit later this year. So shifting gears for a moment, I wanna talk about what's gone into making human-like voices uh, that are giving us the ability that girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. So this is a, a voice I'll play it again for you. That girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. So this is uh, based on Google's Tacotron um, uh, open source effort that they released five years ago. And this is something that we use ourselves uh, to create synthetic voices uh, uh, for uh, for our characters. It's, uh, it's pretty good. That girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. You can still tell that it's, uh, it has a bit mechanical, uh, bit of a mechanical sound to it. I'm too busy for romance. I'm too busy for romance. So the voices are getting better and better. And uh, I'm sure some of you saw uh, Google's uh, uh, release last year of their really very human-like voices. We're waiting for, for those supercomputer-based voices to uh, be made more efficient so that we can begin using them in applications that we can deliver. We're getting really, really close on this. That girl did a video about Star Wars I'm lipstick. too busy for romance. Uh, there was also uh, something a few months ago uh, where, uh, uh, or pardon me, uh, two years ago where uh, uh, Alexa started having customized voices. We can take recordings of people and create synthetic voices based on them. And, and they're pretty good. In this case, uh, it was John Mudge that you could select uh, to be the voice for Alexa. There was also controversy a few months ago. You may have seen the uh, uh, the, uh, the short movie on Netflix uh, on uh, Anthony Bourdain. Well, there was one part where they wanted uh, Anthony to read a letter. Well, Anthony's dead. He couldn't read the letter, so they synthesized his voice. Sounds like the sound clip's not working on it. Uh, it was okay, and they didn't say anything, and that was the reason for the, the controversy. Uh, people thought it was wrong that, the, that uh, the video production company had taken Anthony's voice without any permission and created a synthetic version of it that read, uh, read part of a script uh, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, video that they had produced. I think you're gonna see more and more of that where uh, people blur the lines between real and synthetic and, uh, and it's not always gonna be well received. There's also things like uh, uh, in, in the chatbot world that are getting better and better. Uh, Mina is uh, some wonderful work that Google released uh, two years ago. Uh, this is a different domain than we work in. It's all text-based, but uh, they're doing very important work to, uh, to push things along in this space. The last area is uh, appropriate animation. 
a lot of the seminal work began about 15 years ago at, uh, at USC in their uh, Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, ICT was largely funded by the Department of Defense, uh, doing things like soldier training uh, simulations and, and the like. Uh, ICT developed something that they call Smart Body, which was a system that could uh, interpret what a character was saying and give appropriate facial and, and hand gestures that would go along with that dialogue. And it's still one of the best things uh, in use today. Uh, it's getting a little long in the tooth. So uh, people are working on improvements for, uh, for this work that began 15 years ago. Uh, there's also a lot of AI work that's being done to control characters autonomously. Uh, companies like uh, NVIDIA are leading the charge on, on some of these things, including um, AIs that uh, take videos of actual humans and ingest them into a machine learning process so that uh, the computer can learn uh, what an appropriate response is uh, relative to what a character is saying and uh, dynamically generate that animation. Here's work over at Unity. Uh, doing autonomous generation of computer animation of character movement. Uh, now, this, is, uh, this would be kind of a, a weak AI, but it was a meaningful step in uh, automatically controlling characters as they're moving. There's also a whole world of, of the deep fakes. So the deep fakes are largely uh, based in video overlays over real faces using synthetic control of, uh, of the, the mouth and the, the voice. And uh, this is ad adding a lot, think what you will of, of it as a, as a category, but it's adding a lot of uh, technologies that, uh, that we're able to use to make great characters. And then my favorite work is uh, by a fellow named Stark, who uh, has really done uh, some of the most wonderful work in terms of using video footage of humans to generate synthetic motion. He keeps publishing his work, so he's inspiring others through his hard work. And uh, it's my belief that in a year, perhaps two years, we're going to see commercial product making use of these approaches that we're going to be able to use off the shelf to control characters in ways that are better than the very best uh, hand animator uh, can generate. Uh, our old, old friend Jack Kim, uh, as good as his work is for movies, uh, these AI-driven systems have the ability to outdo even Jack's finest work. So I'm very excited about this. It's not quite ready for prime time yet, but it, it should be very soon. So that's, uh, that's my slideshow for today. And uh, at this point, I'd like to stop this share, go back to video, and uh, open this thing up. Uh, we want to see a community of people interacting with people, just like we're doing today, talking about, in a frank way, about where we are and where we need to go in order to make even better characters than we're making currently. So I think that's a challenge for all of us. And I'd love to hear your questions. I'd love to know more about what you're doing yourself and uh, how we can interact with each other and encourage each other as a community. So um, let me open it up at that point. Dominique, do you have any uh, opening comments? Yeah, um, feel free to, you know, I, I think today we have a lot of people who are very interested uh, learning and talking to you. So maybe we raise your hands and let's see. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions you wanna talk to David, uh, let's, you know, there's an emoji there. You just give me an emoji and uh, yeah, and you know, you will have your order. Okay, so first is me, right? Do you wanna uh, unmute yourself and yeah. Hey, me. Yes. So hello, David. It's uh, Michael Novak. Um, oh. <laughs> I use that as my gnome de zoom. So that way I can filter out. Um, this is great. Uh, my question to you, though, um, I didn't hear you mention. Uh, 
Um, and I apologize, I did come in a few minutes late. Um, have you had any interest from people in the metaverse, things like Decentraland, that might want to add voice or more natural looking capabilities? Oh, so uh, the game community um, is, uh, is an interesting uh, mistress and we've done a lot of online um, systems before that were multi-user. Uh, it's also very difficult to make money in that space. Uh, you know, there's not notable exceptions. Uh, things like uh, uh, like Roblox is uh, galvanizing a whole community of uh, of young users to get into a metaverse setting and and start interacting with each other. It's very cool. And each one each company has built on what's gone before them. If you look back at Second Life, they were the first to robustly right. Uh, monetize um, their version of that metaverse. Uh, we're happy to go there. What we're trying to do is create very simple to use uh, plugins for the two primary game engines, uh, Unity and Unreal, as well as other things like uh, uh, like A-Frame for uh, mm -hmm. augmented reality applications or just basic vanilla WebGL. Uh, our system also works well with uh, we're also supporting other pipelines like uh, Adobe Character Animator, or there's a big community of users that develop characters, wonderful characters in Daz 3D. So we, we're making those walk and talk. Yeah, because I mean, I can see that. The, the glue between, between voice and, uh, and character animation. Yeah, to I me mean, again, I can see that as an add-on. You know, I land in the central land and I want to buy you know, some clothes, or I want to buy something on my property. Oh, I want to look and sound like this today. And tomorrow, I want to change that I could buy that as an artifact within that gaming. And then of course, I look down the road, because I work in uh, that space in the NFT and metaverse space. Mm -hmm. And then I also do work with uh, uh, organizations in conversational voice AI. And I find the two are starting to merge because people are looking at it, number one, in the gaming place. You know, how can I add a new feature? Oh, how about if I add a voice or a, a face? This is what I want to look like. Okay, so pay money and you get that for 30 days. You license it. But then also, on the other hand, um, I see people working in the area of biometrics for authentication. You know, how do I authenticate myself to a system? You know, facial, I won't say it's getting a bad rap. It's getting a bad rap for a reason, but you know, it's very difficult currently. And I see the advances of adding things like a voice to the face, like you were talking about earlier is making them, you know, get over that uncanny valley so they're more precise. I could add that as an attribute that's stored as a credential on a decentralized identity platform. Anyway, there's lots of good stuff going on, but I appreciate this talk today. Thank you. By the way, there have been efforts made on uh, blockchain-based uh, identity um, protection schemes uh, tied to, to avatars. Yes. Uh, by the way, I'm a synthetic character um, um, here in David's behalf today. Uh, just kidding. My, my, my avatar, by the way, is, is really frightening. It makes dogs howl and young children run from the room. Uh, not all of our avatars are, are pretty looking. Uh, trivia question. Can anybody tell me who, what character was the very first AI powered character in the metaverse? I see a lot of blank stares, so I'll, I'll, I'll go, go to ahead. <laughs> uh, in 1996, Dusty the Dustbin joined the metaverse in a Black Sun Point World, uh, uh, their version of the metaverse. And Dusty was literally uh, uh, a little vacuum cleaner with eyeballs. And when you would, and your avatar would enter the space, Dusty would come over to you and strike up a conversation to tell you all about Black & Decker products. So Max Headroom does not count. No, because Max was never in the headroom and Max was never synthetic. Max was a real actor being filmed. 
and made to, uh, video process to look like a synthetic character. But still, Max was important because Max inspired a lot of us to do what we do. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Any Jean, more questions out there? Yeah, the next one will be Jean. Jean, do you want to? Yeah, unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Um, I Jean. think. I think your product is fascinating. Uh, I was wondering, is a beta version of the SDK available? Uh, what are the hardware requirements to run processing on the local machine? And what is the cost to the developer? Okay, so um, first of all, uh, we, well, we don't have an SDK ready. And let me explain why. Uh, we opened up our API four years ago and uh, found that perfectly great engineers were stumbling a lot. And it turns out that conversational AI is such a specialty that, uh, that doing a good job of it is challenging. So we found that early on, we needed to help our customers, even great engineering teams, to build complete solutions, teach them how to use it in a very hands-on way so that they could extend it and maintain it over time. Uh, that's why we've chosen not to make complete SDKs yet, but uh, we're pretty close to it. We have all the components necessary, for instance, to make a Unity or a, or a uh, Unreal SDK. Uh, so where we are right now is just helping people uh, rather than turning over uh, a shrink-wrapped SDK to them. Uh, you may see that change uh, in, in about a year. In terms of um, performance of these characters, we have two primary pipelines. One is, uh, is characters that are just torso only characters that are made for um, smaller screens. And our second main pipeline is based on the metahumans and unity based characters that are high resolution 4K and up resolution. Uh, that our full body, the characters can walk and talk and go anywhere you want. Uh, by the way, I can do a little detour here and show you, uh, show you the low resolution characters on our beta site. Uh, let me do another screen share here. Let's see here. Can everybody see uh, the black sapien X screen with the red dot? Yes. Okay. Hello. 您好, hola. Konnichiwa. So this is our internal beta test site right now. Welcome to Sapien X. We make products talk. I can talk to you about our software, who we are, or almost anything else. What would you like to know about? So this is our general Sage character. Glad you're here. Hello. How's it going today? I guess we have demoitis going here. Uh, we have a number of characters here that you can try. You're talking to me now. Ask me about our company, technology, or how to meet with our team. What do you do? Anyway, you can see that these characters are, are smaller, lower resolution characters that uh, perform well on smaller platforms. Uh, in terms of computational power, um, we're able to run these on things as uh, as uh, low powered as uh, wristwatches or Raspberry Pis. Uh, our higher resolution characters that are based on uh, the the Epic MetaHumans require better graphics cards. Uh, things like game computers run them uh, much better. So does that give you a feel? Oh. We have announced our support for Epic's Unreal platform and also for Unity Technologies Engine. We have a variety of characters up here that uh, our beta testers are uh, testing against right now, including Hazel. Sorry, what was that? Who made you? 
the clever engineers at Sapient X. Nice blue hair. I'm glad you like it. I just got a cut. So these are lightweight characters. If we take uh, take away the, if we run these, for instance, on your Android phone, it takes just 2% of the CPU. Uh, if you strip away the avatar, uh, we can run in as little as uh, 17 megabytes of, uh, of memory on, on a platform. And that's how we can run on uh, little IoT devices. Uh, some of our prototyping right now is with the largest uh, appliance maker in the world. Their vision is they want uh, these voices, uh, voice capabilities in air conditioners and washing machines and very prosaic sort of appliances in the home. And uh, we've got solutions that uh, are anything from very high-end game computers all the way down to these tiny devices. Uh, does that help, Jim, uh, answer your question? Yes, I, I was also wondering what the cost would be to developers to, to make use of for Epic's Unreal platform oh, and also for oh, Unity technology. Let me turn function. off that other system. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. Uh, it's just me now. By the way, we have a character that plugs into Zoom meetings, and uh, her, her name's Kelly. Uh, so you can send uh, Kelly an email, and she shows up in a Zoom meeting. Um, her first things that uh, that she can do is uh, take notes, summarize the meetings, uh, send the summaries uh, by email to everybody in, who's participating. And uh, we also have uh, um, question answering from unstructured data. So for instance, you could turn Kelly loose on your uh, uh, company's uh, uh, information stack and answer silly questions like what the sales results were for the Phoenix operation in 2018 and Kelly would come back with an answer. We're trying to find useful tasks for our AIs to achieve in common settings like, uh, like this kind of meeting. So what would the cost be to developers when, once you get your SDK available? Okay, so um, the costs depend upon the setting, what's in, in the system in terms of functionality and how many units are going out the door. Uh, most of our licensing is based on uh, per unit sales. Uh, we also do SaaS models. Uh, if we're talking about a million cars that have a voice assistant, we're talking about a cost of roughly a euro or, uh, or three bucks. Um, if we're talking about a one-off character where we have to amortize the development cost, that one character perhaps on a large digital sign that uh, at a retail outlet, maybe as much as $100,000, depending upon the amount of labor and love that goes into creating that character. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, next one will be Dan. Hey, Dan, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Um, I, I, your background was very interesting in, in coming from architecture from way, way back. Um, thinking about that, um, I come from a long 3D modeling background for live performances and award shows, mm -hmm. concerts, and a lot of 3D rendering that until this point has been for producers. It's not even for general public. It's, it's renderings. Do you like it? Yes. Are we going to spend the money? Yes. Then that rendering is done. So the purpose of a lot of like what we have created was blueprints, was actually like CAD blueprints was the was the output right for crews to go do it but we had a 3d model which was the stage and we had performers that were stick figures sitting on our stage because we never had avatars to move around on our stages so i've been rendering with vectorworks autocad revit world for 30 years or so and now vectorworks is offering a data smith export which opens up twin motion to all of the like construction people and for all the BIM, you know, uh, 3D modelers and such. So for the very first time in the last 30 years, I now have virtual people walking around in my models, right? And my brain is going, wow, oh, I can make them dance too, because now I've got my little dancers on my stage. And the next step is to put a performer there and to put them center stage so that I could show it to the performer, not to the public, to get it sold and built. Now, once that gets sold and built, it has strong metaverse like potential by that point. 
So I'm kind of throwing that out there of like where we have been with and without avatars and voices and what possibly could be next. So do you remember in Star Wars, the, the chess game where you had the little animated characters that you move yeah. around? There were actually two different Star Wars that had the, those chess board and uh, uh, our uh, animator Jack Kim did the, those characters for the second one. I, I bring it up because we, what we're trying to do is make it as easy as defining the looks of the character, the personality of the character, how, what the character says, how it interacts with people, and dragging and dropping it into a scene. And twi and yeah, twin motion and meta humor are doing exactly that for us for the very first time. And, I, and for me, it's two months old and revolutionary. So like if, if, if those had voices and they were programmable and I could start to put them in formations on stages and such, you, you can, it's not for general public, but it would be eventually. So that's you know? exactly where, where we're heading. We're trying to make it easy enough for you to just drag and drop things into a scene. Uh, we have a lot of heavy lifting to, to get to that point, but that is indeed where well, we're Well, it does at. seem like the data smith has made a nice highway to grab a lot of production people out of, Hol out of Hollywood and send them towards Unreal but I don't see that for Unity at the moment. Well, I, I don't have a window into the internal plans of the Unity team, even though they're friends of mine, they, they won't tell me anyway, uh, but they have the same competitive pressures to keep up with the Epic team. So I'm pretty sure you'll see something that brings them to parity in terms of uh, availability. By the way, as cool as the metahumans are, the gotcha is, uh, to use uh, Unreal in a game or an application that generates more than a million dollars, you have to pay them royalties and that's okay. I mean, they're giving you a lot. So the least you can do is give them some money in return. But uh, if you use a, a MetaHuman, you can't drag it and bring it into another game engine. Uh, you, you do have to use it in that Unreal pipeline. And that's one of the reasons uh, teams like Unity are creating their own characters now. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Ellen. Hey, Ellen. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, pardon my breathlessness, I'm walking uphill. Um, you've alluded to the uptake of where, where your applications are going, the appliances, the um, medical uh, patient assessment with the cat. Mm -hmm. uh, where, are you, where are you seeing or have you identified the the categories or the industries that are most motivated for your tools? So let me talk about that. Um, we started in the automotive industry because we had been working with them for many years. Uh, it's a bit of a difficult mistress because from the time you start talking to a car company to the time your voice assistant might ship in that car could easily be six years or, or, or more. And two years ago, we were faced with a, with a problem. We had COVID breaking out and businesses were, were not just stopping communicating, but they were taking away their R&D budgets uh, to, uh, to prepare for the economic losses due to COVID. Now with the auto industry, they had a second uh, shoe fall and that was the chip shortage. So they had cars sitting in lots ready to go to people and were missing a part or two that they just couldn't buy. Uh, so two years ago, we decided to broaden our focus into some other markets uh, to see where the gold vein was for, for ourselves. And what we, uh, what we have found initially is a lot of interest in the health market that you mentioned, uh, digital signage. Uh, and that digital sign could be a kiosk or could be a screen in a retail setting, uh, acting as a brand ambassador or informing you about a product. Could be at an airport or train station giving you directions. There's a lot of different uses. Uh, we just did a proposal for a bank. Uh, so you walk into the bank branch and the character starts talking to you about uh, product offerings from the bank. So there's a lot of different places that we can use these characters. Uh, we also uh, are working with a couple of vending machine companies on uh, touchless vending machines. Uh, there was a study done in that market saying 87% of U.S. people don't want to touch that screen or that button on a vending machine anymore because of COVID. It totally makes sense. If you can just talk to that machine, 
and uh, and get your can of Coke or your uh, or your. Um, Actually, the first system we did was for Amazon for their warehouse employees uh, delivering COVID masks and safety vests to uh, to their drivers and warehouse workers, uh, all with a voice interface. Uh, and it's interesting to me that they didn't use Alexa for this, but uh, uh, but our voice system works great in that setting. So we're finding all sorts of uh, bellwether markets that uh, are still vital markets, useful markets uh, for these characters. Uh, that uh, that are viable even in the downtime of COVID. Does that answer your question, Ellen? Yes, it uh, it helps. Thank you. I, I can see a lot of uh, potential for beyond consumer level interactions uh, going into the technical markets for uh, user uh, technical manuals, technical uh, uh, training um, in interactions where the engineers and tech folks uh, and even in medical don't have to leaf through the uh, page screen pages of uh, user support materials. Yeah, well, Ellen, this is ET. You and I work in healthcare and you know that in the doctors, the support clinical staff, even the IT guys, they don't read the manual. So right, you can right. have a, a, an avatar character, mm -hmm. give them things in design, or they can pass that on to the end users. God, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be fantastic? <laughs> Yeah, especially as uh, multilingual uh, capabilities become possible and understanding. I, I, I shudder to think sometimes I'm not understood on a, uh, an interactive voice response system on the phone. Um, so I, I can see where there might be challenges in that regard. By the way, our, our system does speak 40 languages and dialects currently. Uh, it's important, and uh, on our roadmap this year is to add the AI uh, system capabilities to automatically understand the language you're speaking. And I'm thinking about, uh, well, it's important in medical, or let's say you have something at an airport, in an international airport, you have people speaking all sorts of languages. And if your AI can automatically understand uh, what language is being spoken and respond to that person, uh, that's huge. Uh, the other call we have for it is simultaneous translation in things like Zoom meetings, where um, when I get on the phone in a Zoom meeting to friends in Japan, usually the younger people in Japan understand my English pretty well. The, the old people <laughs> who, who weren't taught uh, English uh, in, in grade school uh, are struggling with English. So if we can give them simultaneous translation, both directions, Japanese to English and English to Japanese, uh, we have a better meeting. So those are some of the, the curious places that we're using our, our technologies. Yeah. Oh, uh, Blair, do you want to ask questions? Sure. Yeah. Hi, David. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your slideshow. Hey, Blair. Um, Looking at one, um, the one, how to beat the uncanny valley. You have truly conversational AI at 70%. I was curious what you think would get that to 98%. Like what, what's, what we need? Well, so think about what happens in, in our conversations day to day. Uh, the basic things of saying, hey, how's it going? Uh, we've got all that nailed. And just a little bit about that. Usually we're being hired to do narrow domain work to achieve a specific task, whether that's uh, uh, ordering food or delivering a ticket or, or whatever. But uh, our eyes were really opened by, uh, by our friend Brian Eberman, who was the CTO of Jibo, the little home robot. And Brian told me that once they had shipped Jibo for a while into homes, they started analyzing the user logs and they found that 70% of all the conversation with the robot was not task directed. It was more like, hey, how's it going? And I think about my, I don't have a little home robot, but I have two cats here and I talk to them all the time. And uh, I, I think it, there's a basic human need of socializing, even with something that can't return uh, my, my conversation. Uh, we're finding that when our assistants are in the setting, for instance, of the dashboard of your car, they have meaningful tasks that have to uh, happen accurately and reliably. Like when I say, make the window go up, it better go up. Now, 
I also, on a long drive, if I find that that AI system in the car can converse with me, human nature is that most of us will start talking to that character as if it were a friend. So the challenge for us is to be able to converse in, in a human-like way. There's huge areas that we're really not very good at all at, and that is, for instance, humor, sarcasm. It's hard, I know a professor at UC Santa Cruz, her specialty is detecting sarcasm, and she's the right person for it. She's British, so she has a very dry wit, and if anybody can get this nailed down, she will. We're not there yet, so those are future areas of growth. Also, uh, I think when my wife or, and I uh, are at a dinner party, we team talk like many couples do. Uh, she completes my sentences and I tailgate on what she says. Uh, that's something that our conversational systems, nobody has tackled that, that area. So when I say that we have 30% yet to do, actually it may be bigger because there's so many different ways that we act in a social setting as we converse, there's a lot to do. Yeah, so. Thank you. Cool. Next. Yeah, next one will be Heidi. Hey, Heidi, how you doing today? Where did Heidi go? Oh, there she is. Heidi is here. I just had to unmute. I'm from New York. That's my little uh, taxi named Vicky. I'll talk and I just wanted to. What? I'll talk faster for you then. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, no, here's what I was going to say. I was going to add on to Ellen's comment about um, what my friends in uh, technology call RTFM, read the effing manual. But as a mark, I'm a marketer. And I've done. Uh, I'm here because uh, uh, I was told about this meeting by Emily or ET. But I think what uh, what Ellen's point brings up, where I think there can be really great pieces that are missing is taking information that maybe may have been surfaced during a sales process, right? especially for B2B sales, and then changing it so that it gets used. And that same information gets moved to people who are actually using the, you know, getting them on board and using it. Uh, it starts with B2B because those are usually more complex. It's kind of interesting since during COVID, more and more of these sales that everybody thought needed to be done face-to-face -face have been done virtually, either through chatbots or Zoom meetings. But for people who create lots of content and information, which would appeal to uh, also apply to the health or uh, to the health industry and medical industry, is giving people a way to talk to the get get spoken instructions. I mean, and some of it's not that difficult because you're just reusing what you've already created. So, so let me unpack a couple of things that you, you touched on, on there, Heidi. Uh, first of all, I haven't talked at all about our system's ability to gather information. And we try to wear the white hat on that. We're not trying to be Facebook and know everything about you so that we can sell that information to others. We're trying to make use of it to improve your user experience or do a better job of interacting with you. Uh, but um, let me talk about one of our customers uh, that we did a prototype with, uh, uh, PepsiCo. So PepsiCo wanted us to make um, Mixed the Mixologist in a vending machine that would do a custom blend of, uh, of soft drink for you. Now, they were gathering market intelligence on that. They didn't need to know specifically about Heidi Cohen, but they wanted to know Heidi's taste preferences. And if this vending machine was in New York, uh, they wanted to develop trend lines on flavor profiles that could be used to develop new product flavors. Uh, and maybe that was a different profile in Atlanta and a different profile in Los Angeles. Uh, so that was important market intelligence for them. Uh, no, that, that, that makes sense because things like uh, not so much uh, with so I haven't heard it about soft drinks, but for example, PepsiCo owns uh, Frito Lay, and mm -hmm. potato chips in particular are very different depending upon where you live in the United States. Yes, they are. <laughs> right. I mean, it sounds really funny. Is that they 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 dominate because they get the most the mean, um, 
And I love the fact that you say that you wear the white hat when it comes to information. I would believe that while Facebook is bad, um, I would probably argue that Google has more, I mean, Amazon has more information and uses it in ways that most people are not aware of, as does, um, as does Google and any other, or lots of other places where people don't think about it. Um, but that's an entirely different conversation about information security and privacy, et cetera. And it seems to, in today's world, at least the data I've seen, it's much more of a 30 plus decision uh, concern than, uh, than a Gen Z or millennial one. But what I was talking about was not, not to, you know, I personally, I'm not trying to get more information. Mean, I know marketers love more and more information. That said, I was thinking more in terms of the fact that it doesn't have to be um, information driven. It doesn't have to be that data driven. It's that the kind of information that is associated with the product in a specific purchase. So for example, in marketing, I might have a lot of how-to videos that I've created all this content. So it's part of the, per, you know, getting you through the purchase cycle where I think the purchase cycle breaks down and I don't want to overtake your, um, your because everything here you've been talking about is much more advanced than what I'm talking about is just taking, let's say the information, let's say really simple. I mean, it doesn't have to be a B2B sale. Let's say you're a parent and you buy, like I had a friend buy a swing set during COVID and he said, I needed a third hand to hold the instructions, right? If you just explain to someone how to put this stuff together, which a, a voice device or a phone is probably the best thing. It's, it's, you know, I don't think that that is as it's kind of small. It goes to your point of being small and part of it without collecting lots of data. There's another important part, Heidi, of, of what we're doing that I haven't talked about, and that's uh, user sentiment analysis. Uh, our, our AI has built into it uh, word-based sentiment analysis. Uh, and we're able to do that because we break down all the inbound conversation kind of the way your seventh grade English teacher taught you to do it. And we're able to extract information from what you're saying to understand how you're saying it, why you're saying it, what your emotional state is, so that we can better interact with you. And part of that in a marketing setting can be, um, is this marketing message being well received? Is it pissing people off? If it is, we can alter how we interact with that person and get better and more fine tuned at, uh, at doing that. No, that sounds great. Sounds like it's something that people who use either chatbots or IVAs would love to do. Yeah. In, in cars, uh, for instance, with uh, Mitsubishi Mia, uh, we monitor three things. Are you getting sleepy? Are you inebriated? Or are you beginning to experience road rage? And uh, uh, each car company has slightly different things that they want to measure. But those are important things to know uh, and, and react to in, in that particular setting. Uh, you know, as I said, here's my car. So, but I do agree with you. I, I've had it at points where, you know, you're on a road and it gets sleepy, but I don't want to, I'm going to hand it over to someone else. So thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. I'm Michael? happy to continue this later. Yeah. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Michael, do you want to mute yourself? Hey, David. Hey, Michael. It was an awesome uh, introduction. Thank you. And every time you say, oh, I forgot we do this too. It's like a whole nother universe of things that... <laughs> You guys do everything. It's amazing. Um, I mean, the last thing you said about video, or sorry, a sentiment analysis, we need that for our uh, video game chat. Uh, we have uh, a platform that helps uh, colleges and high schools and um, other leagues of video of esports um, to play, you know, interact. It's a super interactive platform. And uh, one of the one of the nasty things that um, happens is is you know uh, hostile chat, <clears throat> and uh, so we'd love to be able to to monitor that in a in a on, you know at scale um, because we can't set a real person in every chat room to do that. So um, so that would be very helpful for us. Uh, do the do the characters require network access to work at this stage? 
no, we can work online and offline. Okay. And we also do trash talk monitoring and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, obfuscation of uh, of fuck you and go to hell and whatever people might say in various yeah. languages. Yeah. And, cool. Uh, um, can the, can any of this be done in a browser at this point? Or? Yeah. 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 Uh, by the way, those characters I showed you a moment ago were running in Google Chrome. Okay. So um, yeah, because we decided to commit to a. Uh, to a browser-based solution instead of doing apps and um, for our platform. And uh, when Unity pulled the plug on the um, on their web version, that was that was really bad uh, for for our. You know, we thought maybe we made the wrong choice after all. <laughs> and then, um, you know, it seems like the the whole uh, advancing of web graphics has kind of stalled a little bit. And it's now focused on game engines instead. So, um, the, the problem with what Unity did, Michael, was they used EM Script and to take their C code and push it out as JavaScript. And uh, it made a very fat client. And uh, a much, much better solution is just to natively build all this in WebGL. Uh, but the tool pipeline for building WebGL apps is not nearly as good as, uh, as it is for doing Unity and Unreal. Yeah, that's that's our problems as well. Uh, in terms of other uh, just ideas to throw out to you, um, when my when my first uh, daughter was born, <clears throat> uh, which was back in the eighties, that gives you a sense of my age. Um, uh, we painted these things on her walls, um, but I I came up with an idea of putting displays on the walls and putting lidar sensors from Polaroid cameras up in the corners. And then, you know, having little characters that she could watch and talk to, and they would know where she was in the room. And, um, you know, they would interact with her. And at that time, uh, you know, there, was no, there were no displays that could be room sized. And um, so, you know, it was an idea way ahead of its time. But uh, now they have the flexible displays and they're super thin and they're pretty much wallpaper. So, I'm just wondering if we could uh, go back to my old idea and have some pets and characters that you know are in kids' bedrooms or or whatever that uh, you know could interact with the kids and they could learn stuff. They could be like educational as well as as playful and what have you. Anyway, that Can was I one, be one of your kids. <laughs> there was uh, a, there was a neat display at CES this year. I, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, it was a tabletop display. And uh, I think it was in the LG booth, and they were displaying little three-dimensional game characters on your kitchen table. Mm, interact. Nice. Well, yes. actually, they didn't interact, but we could make them interact. Yeah, yeah. I think interaction is the crucial thing. Um, I was um, stuck in a hospital bed in the uh, UK in 2015. I had a, an appendicitis, and then it ruptured. And it just occurred to me that if we had a, a, a bedside um, avatar person from your company and I could ask them, you know, how's my status? And, you know, uh, when is the doctor coming? And when am I going to get my food or my medicine or, um, or just talk to them? You know, like you were saying, just have a, have a fun conversation. That would have been a, a super helpful thing <laughs> to get through a two or three week hospital stay. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful idea. One, one of my favorite proposals was for robots to greet children at the Jack Nicholas uh, uh, Children's Hospitals in South Florida. Mm. These are kids that have been diagnosed with cancer or some terrible, scary disease, and they're going yeah. to the hospital for the first time. They're petrified. And mm -hmm. you can start warming up that experience and uh, interacting with the kids uh, with a virtual character. Uh, it, it's got to be a wonderful thing for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have uh, I have a lot of friends who are musicians, and they've um, you know done as the best they could. They get pianos installed into the hospitals, and they would play music for the patients and stuff. But so they had some real, you know, kind of interactive stuff going on with the conversations around the music. But anyway, uh, the other things that occurred to me are libraries. Uh, if we if we continue to have libraries, I think avatars who can be, 
you know, virtual librarians uh, could be really helpful because each person could get one when they came in the, in the library and they could help them negotiate their knowledge search in, in much more powerful and natural ways than a Google search bar would do. We, we built something a little bit like that as a prototype for, for Lowe's. Uh, the idea is the characters on a big screen when you walk in the front door, you might say, where do I find the XYZ wrenches? And our character says, well, that's aisle 17. Uh, I, don't, I, I remember going to a Home Depot and trying to find a come along and they, they passed me from person to person. Finally, they found the old guy who knew what a come along was. And he said, aisle 17. <laughs> That's great. You could nail that right off. Yeah. I mean, we it also, could be, it could be on a, on a, uh, on a tablet or a phone or uh, whatever, and then it won't disturb everyone else, you know, cause you can just wear your earbuds and same thing with museum docents, you know, um, it's so much more nice when a real person is walking around with you and talking to you and telling you about the art. And instead of the little tape recorder that just says, go to station number seven now. And <laughs> when you get there, you know, let me know. And, <laughs> and uh, I just think that would be, you know, if you could ask questions, you know, of the, of the, the virtual docent, that would be so powerful, you know, and the knowledge sphere can be, you know, fairly small. So it's, um, it's, you know, the database you need, the knowledge you need for that space is, is confined, you know, so. One of my old friends is working on, on that particular thing uh, for the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, Vincent can tell you about his paintings. Ah, oh, perfect. How wonderful, huh? <laughs> perfect, yeah. Anyway, just wanted to throw some ideas out to you. I just say one point to uh, what Michael just said about um, museums. Real quick, I'm sorry to jump the line. Is that okay, Dominique? Hey, yeah, you sure, can have please. my time anyway. I'm I'm done. Thanks. Okay, I just please. was going to say, if, for those of you in the United States, um, the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is a gem of a small uh, museum, we're not talking about the Van Gogh Museum or the Met or the Getty or something like that. They have used AI and done an incredible job and what happens is if you go into the museum so it's to michael's point they have a whole wall of their paintings and you can pick how you want to go through their exhibit it will download it you can have it and it talks to you all the way through and there are a number of other games they have done it is i saw it in 2019 um after it is just amazing it is one of the best uses of AI, of combining AI and um, content in a way that makes it user friendly. You're making me want to go to Cleveland now. Um, if you'd like, I can put you in touch with the person who, uh, the, I know the woman who, we got a tour by the their chief digital officer. Anyhow, I'm sorry to interrupt and jump no. ahead. Oh, no worries. Uh, can you provide the link? Uh, or official website on the chat, maybe. Uh, let me go look it up, I can. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Michael, yeah, do you wanna continue? Uh, no, I'm good though. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'd love to love talking to you and hearing all your stuff you're doing. Cool, thank cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a question, which is uh, yeah. previously you said that Sapien didn't uh, collect data. And I am wondering like, um, cause you know, like AI without collecting, knowing you deeply, it's kind of, you can do like, um, you know, greeting or, you know, like I would say more superficial, right? Um, function, but how can you personalize that person? Because without collecting data, you don't know that person, then how can you provide, for example, like just Michael said that, oh, my medicine, like when can, like it will remind you to take medicine, but without knowing your, history, how can this bot or um, meta human help us to deal with something more complicated mm -hmm. rather than uh, the simple greeting or simple entertaining? Yeah, my question. So maybe I had misspoke, Dominique. Uh, we do collect data. What we don't do is sell it. Oh. We see that <laughs> as being the line uh, that, that we're uh, being careful not to cross. Uh, think that a conversation is a very uh, kind of sacred and trusted experience. 
and uh, that we can't violate that by by selling that by by hiding what we're doing and and selling that data. Um, we also have to be very careful that we don't collect data on children, uh, which uh, there's been a lot of lawsuits over companies across that line, and uh, perhaps rightly so. Uh, also, when we're operating in Europe, we're under GDPR and uh, have to be very careful that we're protecting that data in meaningful ways. Now, there's a reason that something like Alexa uh, requires an internet connection. If you think about it, the only way for them to collect and sell that data is if it's transmitted over the internet. Uh, we uh, store, we can store the data locally or, or uh, on an internet server, it doesn't matter to us. But if we're storing it locally, we're able to protect it there and keep that sensitive information in a place that, uh, that the, the user is comfortable with. Um, yeah, and another question is that if AI, because we, we, we all seen a lot of movies, like, uh, and there, there are a lot of horrible prediction, which is once AI learns so much and they have their thoughts or they become, uh, you know, like anti-human, because actually at the end, you know, the evilness of this entire planet is human. Uh, they will figure out pretty soon because they are so smart. And what, what, like, yeah, because all those stuff is kind of like, uh, I know, like, we are trying to make those meta humans serve for us. What if one day they fight for their rights? For example, you know, like some prom or, you know, some sex, um, you know, robot. What if they, they, they want to have the same right as human? And yeah, what, what, what do you see like those, you know, uh, so future is? We, we get trolls that are concerned that that we were a building block on the way to Skynet, uh, that uh, we're gonna be replacing humans with, with uh, synthetic characters and robots, uh, that we're gonna do evil things with the data that we collect. Uh, on one hand, they give us way too much credit. We're, we're pretty far from, from being as evil as they would imagine that we have the ability to be. But it, it is an important topic and we take it seriously and that's why we're we as a company are trying to wear the white hat. Uh, I will tell you that all the big companies wear the black hat without exception. Uh, even Apple pretended for years not to be collecting user data until they were called out a couple of years ago by an investigative journalist that uh, monitored the packet flows in and out of uh, Apple devices and proved that they were collecting that data. And uh, they had to fess up that, yeah, they were doing it, but, oh, we're not doing it anymore live. Well, so that's that's baloney. Uh, they're still doing it. Uh, they're just not doing it in a streaming sense. They store it and then every once in a while send it back to the mothership. So uh, Apple's playing games with words. The fact is they, they all do what we consider to be evil things with the data they're collecting. And that's a good concern. Uh, I'm glad people care more about data privacy in Europe than we do here in the US. We're starting to wake up, but have you ever downloaded Facebook's data that they collect on you? It's a very sobering moment. They collect about 250 data fields on you. Oh, I right now I work for Facebook, so I'm not allowing saying anything, okay. but okay. I just uh, ask question on my personal behavior. But yeah, I mean, all those Facebook stuff, I, yeah, it's just legal bounded. I couldn't. So uh, I'm just going to ask you then to go, to go there, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you that there is a lot of information. There's also healthy conversations happening internally in, in, in Facebook. Uh, the, where people are questioning is this, are they doing the right things? Uh, yeah, uh, can you provide the link for like how to download your Facebook data? Because I mean, I haven't been there. Yeah, I'm just curious. So if you just Google, how do, how do I download my Facebook data? Okay. Uh, there's great instructions online. I'm doing that and I did it and it was frightening. And I found things like somebody had posted something on my Facebook page and it turns out the guy was a Nazi. So all of a sudden there's an association between me and Nazis on my Facebook page. That's pretty scary stuff. And uh, 
viewed by the wrong person misinterpreting the data, maybe they would construe that I was somehow related to this person. These things concern me a lot and we don't want to be that kind of company. We want to be somebody that people trust. Let me talk about trust for a moment. There's been some, um, uh, some landmark studies that one of them found that uh, in a medical setting, people will tell our characters more than they'll tell their family doctor. So the researchers were astounded by this. How could that possibly be? So they did a second study and found out that the reason was that our characters don't impart judgment. When I go to my family doctor, I go, I know, I know, I've gained weight. Uh, yeah. I don't want to be judged, but uh, even the most talented doctor imparts some sort of judgment on, on those experiences. And that's why we trust these conversational systems more. Uh, another thing that another study found that when there's an avatar to the voice, the trust score goes up by 20 to 25%. That's pretty important. So it means that uh, the visual properly tied to the voice improves that experience such that people trust more. Another study uh, was based upon um, if you put some eggs out at the side of the road, I'm a farmer, if you put eggs out on the side of the road and a basket where people can put the money on an honor system, um, they found that if there was a picture with the eyeballs next to that basket, people were more honest. This is so, very interesting, doodling eyes, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, in our first work in the metaverse uh, back in 96, uh, we uh, uh, were working with Black Sun. Black Sun found that nobody would come up to avatars and talk to them if they lacked eyes. Mm. So there's some deep sort of stuff embedded in us human beings that uh, tie conversations strongly to a face a properly formed face with eyeballs that animates the way we're used to seeing humans animate. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, hey, so honey. yeah, so maybe, you know, put some, you know, fake avatar around my house and can keep me safe or something. I don't know. Yeah, just, yeah, thank you so much. This is very interesting, yeah, uh, conversation. Yeah, and the next one will be Jean. Uh, yes, I'm, yeah. I'm an engineer. I'm sort of fascinated by your preparation process. And just as a contrast, I'm going to throw a link in the chat. Um, and it's about a system called Megatron Transformer. I'm not kidding. This is from NVIDIA. They must have licensed the name. And um, anyway, the, the article, which people can read at their leisure, is about uh, this AI system that read 63, 63 million English news articles from 2016 to 2019, 38 gigabytes worth of Reddit discourse, and a huge number of Creative, creative Commons sources. And um, it actually participated in a debate about the ethics of AI. And it had some sort of disquieting things to say. But anyways, my, what, what my question is, and, and I also have a suggestion for an application area. But what my question is, uh, it seems like this process, this setup process that you go through is the bottleneck in, in your process of getting this out to market. And um, I'm just wondering, what is the difficult part of that uh, setup process? And is there, are there any ways to sort of reduce that bottleneck? Okay, so there's a lot in that question. So let me just focus on initially what it takes to make a conversation, a synthetic conversation. So historically, every voice system that you've ever interacted with was created by an engineer in a text editor. Uh -huh. That's a bottleneck. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of the conversations uh, have been written by engineers. And I don't mean to slam engineers, but in general, the best conversationalists I know are not engineers. <laughs> engineers 
our best engineers tend to be people that uh, are very focused and maybe have a little bit of Asperger's going on. They're not the, they don't tend to be the spark plugs at the, at the cocktail party. So what we want to do is open up conversational design to people who are talented conversationalists to make characters that are engaging and to provide the tools that a non-technical person might be able to use to create these conversations more easily. So we've been working on a system that, uh, that we call Raygun Studio uh, that operates on the notion that uh, Hollywood script writing tools that are familiar to non-technical people would be a good interface paradigm for creating AI powered conversations. So that's something that we're working on. Uh, I can also tell you about a second more ambitious program that we're working on uh, that we've had in a patent process uh, that was just published in December. And that is um, that we can use our AI characters to converse with you to design a new AI character and forget Hollywood script writing tools, just talk and create a new character by talking. Uh, we have another thing that goes way back to our earliest uh, government work. Uh, the project back then was called the Virtual Saddam Project. The notion was what if the AI can read all the books available on a person and distill that information and assume the personality and the, uh, the thought processes of that person. Uh, we're, we're heading down that road right now. Uh, there was an open source project released uh, uh, by Stanford uh, that a lot of people have worked on that uh, would have the AI read technical information and answer questions about it. What, what is the name of that project, by the way? It's slipping my mind, but if you do some Googling, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and about a year ago, one of the people who had done leapfrog development on that system got better than a human being wow. by just a little bit. Wow. So uh, for us, uh, we could use such a system, uh, for instance, to read a car manual. Exactly, exactly. It or the marketing have, materials uh, for a product. We also trawl through uh, Wikipedia and our system will answer questions from Wikipedia. You got uh -huh. 40 terabytes of data there. <laughs> There's a lot to go through. So, so far we just answer questions about people and places. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the, the second part, I, are, you, are you finished with that? I can go on for hours, but I'm finished for now. Okay. <laughs> um, this, the second part of what I wanted to say is that um, I think one good application area is for, you know, there's a lot of people that are getting older and getting senile and uh, going into nursing facilities and so forth. Uh, one of them being my mom. And uh, so uh, one of the things that she likes to do is talk to friends on the phone. And, um, and she's always losing her list of telephone numbers. So uh, we bought her one of these jitterbug flip phones. She can't really handle anything with a computer. She's a total technophobe. Uh, and my dad used to handle all that stuff. He used to design robots for manufacturing, but uh, he's passed away. And um, what I found when I was researching all this stuff is there's not really anything that's very good for what she needs. You can get the jitterbug phone. Uh, the, late, the latest version of it has some problems. For example, if you ask it to call someone, you have to say, Alexa, ask lively to call so-and-so and try getting an 80 something year old to do that, you know? And so I'm in the process right now of um, writing a bunch of Alexa routines to get around all that stuff. Uh, plus, you know, you want to limit when people can one of the other big complaints about that product is that a lot of telemarketers call. So you need to get around that. You need to be able to create a whitelist or whatnot to get around that kind of stuff. So I have some ideas for how I can do that. 
But in general, my mom would like to view photos. She would like to play music, but she just can't handle something like a tablet or a smartphone. And I think, but she can talk. She can talk your ear off for hours about stories and so forth. She has no problem con conversing. So I would think a system like yours would be perfect for that domain. And there is a huge number of people entering those types of situations. So, so the research really reinforces what you said. Uh, we are most popular in our voice systems with the very young and the very old. Uh-huh. I'll tell you, my eyesight isn't what it used to be. So uh, uh, I find my, even myself at 63 starting to be more interested in voice interfaces than ever. Yeah, I have like an Apple Watch and, you know, you have to have a voice interface for that. And a lot of the fonts on the smartphones are like one point fonts. I can't read them. Uh, so uh, you definitely need uh, better user interfaces for a lot of these things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jean. And next one, uh, Heidi, do you want to ask questions? Hey, Heidi. Yeah. Hi. I just was going to comment on a couple of things that were already said. When you were talking about having, um, there's two. One is when you're testing new, who, who talks to who and who gets recognized by these avatars. Um, one of the problems a lot of early companies have had is that it only sees people who are white. That you cannot have times people of color have to wear very big glasses and things so that they are visually seen by the, um, I think this goes back to your comment about the, the you know, what, what people will say to their doctor versus what they will say to um, an avatar. And I think there's three points. One, some of these, some of these, um, from what I've heard, some of these, well, some of this AI does not necessarily see or view people of color. They're not as inclusive. And sometimes the language is different. The second one is I have heard similar to the doctor that people will say more to an avatar than they will say to a human. It applies to other, other situations where there is kind of like, you don't want to tell the, the doctor, yeah, I gained a little weight. Well, it could actually be more something that's actually more negative. You know, it happens. Uh, I've heard people say that this applies to things like credit. I'd rather talk to an agent than go into my local bank and say, I need more, more credit because then they'll look at my credit score and they say, oh my God, how could you get such a bad credit? How could you not take care of that? So they, they're more likely to use avatars, for, and I believe this, I, I haven't seen research, but my guess would be regardless of age, if they think there's not, there's no judgment, it's judgment free, which also gets you into age issues on certain things, let's say with under 18s. And lastly, to um, Jim's point, I think that it depends who's using those phones and how you program them. So, so yeah. I, I'd like to bundle your comments into uh, into kind of a category of accessibility. Okay, um, I'm just gonna. I just wanted to bring those points up. I'm sorry. I, I should probably no, no, I, not I, have been. I think they're. I think they're important points. So I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Uh, I'm kind of excited about what we're doing because uh, we have had uh, proposals uh, of using our voice systems for people that have uh, vision issues. And uh, our very earliest one was uh, to combine our system with uh, a mapping system to give audio cues to, to blind people as they walk around cities. Uh, it was funded by, uh, by the military uh, who wanted to give audio cues to soldiers in the field saying things like, careful, you're about to walk into a minefield. But the, the same technology could be repurposed for, for people to help them navigate in the city that they couldn't see. So I'm excited about that. Uh, uh, we had uh, the National Park Service they had a dilemma. They have a submarine in San Francisco that's uh, that you can visit, but only if you have the physical ability to climb down into that that submarine. So they wanted a virtual version of the submarine that a person could tour if they weren't physically able. Uh, so I'm I'm excited to make equivalent facilitation for people 
who uh, don't have all the same physical abilities that I have. Uh, now, uh, our system doesn't have at its core a vision system. So we don't have the black people, white people vision issue. We could connect to video systems that, that do that, but we have a different type of issue. Um, one of our customers assigned three test engineers to us. One was from Italy, one was from India, and the other was from France. And it was a huge challenge for us to give an equivalent experience to those three engineers that have had heavily accented English. So that's one of the big challenges for us going forward is to give everybody a good experience. When I speak to our system, I'm able to get up to 99% accuracy. Uh, many of our uh, customers uh, are from Japan. Uh, on average, when they speak to a voice system, they only get about 70% accuracy. We are working with people to develop techniques to make the recognition of non-native speakers better. And that's a huge area for us. Once again, we want everybody to have a good experience. And that means we have to work harder to achieve that. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, I have one question. It seems like right now the um, Apple Watch or you know Apple device will be our new doctor, which help us to monitor everything like a purity data. There's no judgment. Maybe you know sometimes I see one phrase which is like, "Oh, you walk um, five thousand uh, k step less than last week," and I feel guilty. Like, "Oh, I have to." go out and walk. And sometimes my Apple watch will pop up like, hey, um, you can do it. You still can do it. It's like a late night and I didn't close my rings and it's just like trying to get you up and start work exercise, exercising. So I think interesting thing is that technology is slowly replacing the doctor part. Then maybe in the future, you see like people even trust the, the, the AI robot more than a doctor, then maybe doctor can be, you know, before they are the front, front line of the warrior, like talking to people, maybe at the end, they just like, you know, at a uh, backstage, right? And there's a curtain and they just like doing all the assessment and then all the AI or the machine will help us to keep us healthy, right? Like even, you know, like right now the food, right? Like with the blockchain, we know better about the food and vertical farm, right? I, I feel like right now the people willing to pay farmer more than doctors. So maybe in the future doctor will be, you know, one of the engineer just, you know, access because sometimes AI cannot do something that human can do. So maybe doctor just support the, U, the AI system and the, the AI system will help us to keep us um, healthy. I don't know. It's just some thoughts. Well, I'd like to talk about that and express a highly opinionated point of view. I think doctors are wonderful. I love our doctors. I don't want to replace them. I want to help them. And I think there's three areas that we can help them the most. One is doing the things that they hate doing, such as a patient interview. There's no reason a doctor or a highly paid a uh, professional nurse should have to take down my address and, and uh, my allergies and all that stuff. Or, you know, you go to the pharmacist and you go to pick up your pills and the pharmacist with their years of training has to say, now take water, take this two, two times a day. Do you have any allergies? We can do that for them. So we can do the boring. Number two, we can do the th things that the doctor's not around for. We can monitor you 24 seven and report issues to the health team. We can ask you, did you take your pills today, Dominique? We can watch you taking your pills and report to your doctor that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, so that 24 seven capability is something that nobody can afford to do otherwise. And talking about affordability, I think there's another thing that's not talked about much, and that is if we can do a good job of certain tasks, we can provide them more economically. Our very first customer had us do a psychiatric evaluation. Now, she had been 
and she had headed a, a 500 person psychiatric firm for a number of years and had reduced the psychiatrist role to a set of rules that we could impart to one of our characters to do psychiatric assessment, evaluation, and recommendations. And there are people in the health community that think we shouldn't be doing that because only a doctor should be doing it. But if we can do a good job of something like that, we can, do, we can provide that service to people that ordinarily couldn't afford it. Uh, we did the same thing with another startup that was doing career counseling. And maybe we can't replace a career counselor, but we can certainly supplement that career counselor and provide meaningful advice for, uh, for somebody who maybe otherwise wouldn't use it or couldn't afford it. Mm, yeah, I, I do hear like in one podcast, it seems like uh, they, they, they address that radiologist, right? Um, well, kind of become absolute just because AI will do a better job to you know to to do that and also radiologists they have you know like some um, danger exposing themselves to the radios uh ra radiates so i i think um a lot of uh, structure will be changed just by ai jumping and also like some nurse right without like because if ai can monitor the the body health of a patient then, you know, 24 hours shift, you know, like some night shift uh, nurse, they probably can, you know, uh, find other jobs or <laughs> find other meaningful jobs. Yeah, so yeah, so I think that will be very interesting to see, like maybe only some doctors, they are so good, so amazing that AI assist them, but the rest of the job, they probably need to go do something else. Like, well, I'm, I'm um, glad you brought up the radiological thing, and it reminds me that we have to, as an industry, be careful that we don't hype people. Uh, IBM ran a lot of commercials about how they could read an x-ray better than a doctor. Turns out it was all bullshit. Um, I, and I found this out through meetings that I was having with Kaiser Permanente, who told me that the medical group that paid IBM for that work uh, flushed $100 million down the drain, wrote it off because it didn't work. But uh, IBM not only got $100 million, they, they got a lot of TV commercials out of that. Uh, IBM also did things like uh, uh, showed uh, Watson guiding a bus, and it was a delightful commercial. Uh, it doesn't actually exist. Um, it was a commercial. We can't delude ourselves and we can't delude people that are customers. We have to, if we're going to move this forward, we have to be honest with people about what we can and can't do. So I, I think that's important. There's a um, uh, Digital Beings Facebook page that has uh, about 6,000 people in it. And if you read the posts on it, People are talking about all sorts of imaginary stuff as if it was real. Oh, we have a digital influencer that's uh, out there selling people and uh, and uh, creating all this momentum for for the products that they're supporting. And I see so much of that stuff, and then the press gets a hold of it and starts talking about it as if it's real. And then you get the trolls coming in saying, "Oh, you're building Skynet." And uh, this, uh, this can be very harmful to those of us who are trying to be real with people and create things that really work and actually serve important needs for people. So uh, uh, I'll get off my soapbox. I just wanna be careful that we don't delude ourselves and we don't delude those people that we're uh, building these systems for. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Michael, too. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Michael? Hey, just uh, one quick. Hey, hey man, uh, just one quick uh, thing uh, about the issue of um, int uh, interpreting um, uh, speakers with accents mm -hmm. that you brought up a while back. Uh, I got a, a patent at Nokia uh, for having the phone um, uh, do do um, training, um, voice training, 
you know, recognition training while you're, while you're on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, having this sort of nugget of rules and stuff that would be available to any other service when it came time to, to have you um, be understood uh, by, by the other service. So there's this sort of whatever nugget of, of uh, data and, and roles and things that is, has been trained uh, you know, to recognize you and understand you. And then, you know, when it comes time for the, your system to recognize me, then I can just grant you access to this nugget. And now you can understand me basically. Um, so that, that was, uh, I don't know, they thought it was a good idea and they filed it, but, um, I don't know if some sort of an open, maybe some sort of an open source thing or something that would, contain that that nugget of um, speaker recognition uh, could be could be standardized and maybe uh, you know it could be that um, uh, you know all these systems could could up their 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 recognition level by um, having trained data as available as well so it's an interesting topic um, there is a wonderful project that Mozilla started a few years back called the open voice system and it was user contributed voices to build data models to train in all the world's languages and uh, some of them are much further along but there's uh, there's languages like Quechua from Peru in there and uh, eventually there will be enough native speakers of Quechua that will contribute their voice so that we'll be able to make conversational systems that understand languages that uh, that were dying languages before, and uh, we'll, we'll keep them alive or serve uh, underserved communities. Um, we've done proposals for uh, medical networks in Africa, and Africa is a particularly uh, difficult place. There's there's uh, more than 300 primary languages in Africa. Uh, we only speak three of them currently: uh, Arabic, English, and Afrikaans. I suppose you French uh, colonial. Uh, and Portuguese colonial languages are also spoke there. But um, there's all sorts of languages in, in uh, Africa. India is another one. Uh, there's hundreds of different languages there that we need to support. And perhaps through open source things like, uh, like Mozilla has started, uh, we'll be able to do that. Um, yeah, that sounds uh, fascinating. Um, you know, I, I, when I work for Fujitsu, um, uh, you know, the native speaking language was Japanese, but um, they often spoke English on the phone. And so the phone would have had the ability to train on them speaking English as well as speaking Japanese. And when I worked for Nokia, you know, obviously the, the Finns um, speak English all the time on their phones. So it was easy, it was easy to uh, train the phone to recognize the speaker in multiple languages that way. And um, you know, create this sort of data that could be shared to another system that would make the other system smart all of a sudden on that particular speaker. There's there's interesting research that's going on for non-native speaker recognition. Um, there's a professor at San Francisco State, uh, Guy Brazan, that uh, uh, was just kind of playing around with voice systems. He found that by training an English speaking system also in German and other languages, that all of a sudden uh, it understood non-native speakers better. He doesn't know why, which is typical of ML researchers. Uh, they don't always know why things work. They just know when they work or don't work. Uh, but uh, we are making progress as an industry on understanding non-native speakers. Yeah, that's fascinating. There. Thank you. Cool, cool. Yeah. Any other questions? I think Heidi, before you uh, raise your hand, do you want to share your question? Oh, it, it, the point the the point passed, so it's okay. <laughs> you folks, right, are, all I was going to say is I have great a, questions. I it, it's what? been a lot of a lot of fun talking with you. Yeah, I don't want to keep everything. We've taken this going. in a bunch of different directions, and they've all been good ones. I was going to say the the one thing I was going to say is that I believe it's the Mayo Clinic actually has been using AI 
not for all of the medicine. And I think a lot of people wouldn't be using, let's say telemedicine if it wasn't for COVID, um, but, they, but the idea of using it for what's considered compliance in, in medicine, meaning getting people to use the medicine mm -hmm. and follow-up visits and things like that and post, uh, that's what they're using it for. There's very um, healthy research that's going on uh, in, in AI with, with Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, a lot of the big organizations have groups that are doing uh, meaningful uh, work in, in, in those areas. Uh, there's even uh, small groups. Uh, my friend uh, Mike Carito founded uh, Ellipsis Health here in California focused on one thing, understanding uh, depression and using the AI systems to, uh, to monitor depression in, in people. And uh, he, he just uh, closed a $28 million round. So I guess they're gonna make a product that uh, actually is gonna help people. So that's pretty cool. Cool, yeah. Any other questions? Um, anyone? Last, last minute? That's one. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, thank you, David, uh, joining us today and be our speaker. And we had a lot of very high, high, high level talk. And I really appreciate, um, I know you are really busy and I really appreciate your time um, and pulling all the really amazing futuristic concept and also history, right? History of the robot and uh, share with us and thank you so much. And uh, yeah, and hopefully see everyone next Saturday. Bye-bye. Mm. By the way, I just uh, posted my email for everybody and uh, I'll send the, the deck to Dominique uh, to, to post for all of you. Thank yeah. you all for spending so much time with me today. And uh, it sounds like you're all doing really cool stuff. I'd love to know more. Uh, feel free to write me, okay? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks David. Thanks, everyone. Um, E.T., oh. I think we've connected most of us. So I'm on LinkedIn and, you know, keep those ideas coming and hopefully we'll be able to work together and make good things happen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye now.